Welcome to the Elon Podcast with your hosts, Pastors Fred Penny, Jason Martin, and Greg Bowers. Let's get to it. Welcome to the Elon Podcast. My name is Pastor Greg Bowers. I'm the next generation pastor at a church called Elon Pentecostal Tabernacle in St. John's, Newfoundland. And we are here again today recording another podcast. Uh, it's extremely good to be back. Uh, again, we took a long break doing this. Uh, we, we were trying to do the whole every two week thing. We missed last week, still trying to get in a rhythm. Uh, but we're just good to be back doing this and having good conversation around topics around church, around society, and all these different things. Uh, So before we begin, before we get into what we want to talk about today, we're going into kind of what we talked about in our last podcast. And if you missed it, we talked about heading into a sermon series around the vision of Elam. And uh, that involves three words. It involves upreach, inreach, and outreach. And today we are going to be talking about upreach. But before we do that, again, let's give a quick hello. Fred, you can give everybody a big hello. Yes, good morning, everyone. Hi, Greg. And Jason. Good morning. It's good to be together with you gents again uh, doing this, and hello to everybody out there. And if this is your first podcast, Jason is, of course, the Connections Pastor here at Elam, and Fred is the lead man. He is the lead pastor here, and uh, yeah, we're, we're excited to get to this podcast today. So first of all, um, I think we can get right into it today because uh, we've got a lot to talk about. Upreach is a huge conversation and involves a very... Uh, sometimes overwhelming feeling of worshiping a God that seems so big. Um, and there's a lot to that. So when we say the word upreach, um, I think it'd be great for all of us to define what upreach means, so especially if, so the audience can understand uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So I'm going to start with you, Jason. When I say upreach, how do you define that? Well, uh, I mean... Um, as Pastor Fred has been, uh, I know you're asking me, but I'm kind of piggybacking off uh, off Pastor Fred's, uh, the way he has kind of framed this over the last couple of years here at Elam uh, with the whole, uh, you know, reaching up to God in, in both prayer and worship. Um, so for me, like upreach is, is really that, that vertical relationship. It's, it's me and God, but it's us and God, and it's, it's everything pertaining to you know, how I relate to him, uh, again, through prayer, uh, through worship, which, as you said, is is a very, very broad topic that I'm sure we'll unpack a little bit as we keep going. But, yeah, to me, it's it's that vertical relationship, awesome. uh, you know, reaching up to God. And, Fred, before I even got here, before I was on staff, well, these are the three words that you used even in our initial conversations before I came here, upreach, and reach, outreach. So um, these are dear to your heart. Uh, especially in terms of the mission of the church. Uh, so we, when we, again, when we talk about upreach, what do you think uh, when we talk about that? Well, I think a church that honors the Lord has to be in vital relationship with him. And we can go through the motions of Christianity and religious habit, but there has to be a vibrancy and a life uh, in the local church as well as in the individual Christian. So taking care of and nurturing that relationship with Christ is, is essential to everything else. The, the in-reach and the outreach won't work and they won't be healthy without that vital, um, close relationship with our Lord. So... As a, as a church, we want to we want to nurture that. We want to encourage that. We want to foster that. So that means, you know, when we gather, there needs to be life and a sense of God's presence. And during the week, when we're doing our individual prayer, reflection, scripture reading, etc., following what we would call the spiritual disciplines, uh, then. That also needs to be vibrant and alive. So a lot of conversation that we had the uh, last couple months, I guess, um, we were looking at prayer and we were looking at worship, which are two big words in the Christian yeah. faith. And um, 
it's one of these things sometimes we just kind of take it for what it is and we don't really think about it uh, or ways we can practically uh, develop ourselves in, in our prayer life and also our worship life as well and broadening that definition of what that looks like. Um, when it comes to prayer, first of all, we talked a lot about the Lord's Prayer, um, which is even something that we tend to miss uh, of saying it's a very simple prayer. It was given to us for a reason, uh, but it has a lot of power behind it. When it comes to the Lord's Prayer, um, how beneficial is it for Christians to be reciting that prayer in, in their daily week? Or is there not as, you know? It's interesting, like the, the Lord's Prayer is found in two Gospels, Luke and Matthew. In one of them, Jesus says, this is how you should pray. And in the other one, he says, this is what you should pray. Mm. So in one case, it's encouraged you know, to recite it. And in the other case, it's encouraged to use that as a framework mm -hmm. or a structure for prayer. And I think both are the case. And I think throughout the history of the church, both has been have been practiced. So uh, a few weeks ago, you know, when we looked at the Lord's Prayer, uh, we had a week of prayer here at the church based on the different phrases in the Lord's Prayer. And we sent out daily devotionals based on those phrases in the Lord's Prayer. And, you know, one of the ones that stands out for me in that prayer is your kingdom come. And I, I think often we may have thought about that as looking toward the return of Christ. But while that's true, we're praying for Christ to return and establish his kingdom in full. We're also wanting his kingdom to break into mm. the here and now. And I think that applies, you know, to me as an individual person, but also to us as a community. Uh, the, the more the, the reign and rule of Jesus, our king, uh, is experienced and is, is at work, uh, the better off it will be, I think, for all of us. That's good. That's good. I... I one of the biggest things, at least in my Christian faith, is that idea of the kingdom breaking through in present. And uh, as much as a hope we have in the future, and it's a beautiful hope, it's a beautiful future, and we look forward to that, um, I think it's a beautiful thing that in this very moment, um, the kingdom is here in, in, a, in, a, in a form, and we can look to that, and we can pray for ourselves and grow in that and develop ourselves as people of the kingdom right now. And I guess too, Greg, you know, we, we put that kingdom alongside the kingdom of darkness, mm. right? And so the kingdom of Christ coming is pushing back the kingdom of darkness. Mm. And, uh, and that highlights, you know, this spiritual conflict mm. that we find ourselves in. One of the, one of the things I, I found really interesting as well, Thinking back to that uh, that sermon, <coughs> Pastor Fred, uh, in the Lord's Prayer, was was the way he brought out even just the way this prayer begins. So Jesus Himself begins with our breach, in in the Lord's Prayer, yeah. in, in just that that thought of our Father. And I remember Fred bringing that out about how how he even likes you know to hear you know people pray referencing you know our Father. Uh, and again, and, and, and Jesus' whole ministry models that, that almost first priority connection, that upreach to the Father. Mm -hmm. And it, it kind of just, you know, the times that he spent getting alone and just, uh, you know, you can have a tendency sometimes to look at Jesus and, and the busyness and the activity of his ministry. But even Jesus... Jason, here's a, time. here's a crazy thought. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, you reminded me of that, those comments. I think in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, you know, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. Yeah. I and the Father are one. Mm. It's going to sound maybe a little weird, maybe a little crazy, but I wonder, you know, if we would aspire to the point where, you know, if, if a Christian could say, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, or mm. if you've seen me, you've seen a reflection of God. Mm. You know, like yep. that's an interesting way to kind of talk about. Well, I mean, you, you look at the Apostle Paul and, and, and you know, he, he was he was confident enough to, to make the statement, follow me as I follow Christ. And I think, yep. you know, that's a little bit of, of a similar thought there, you know, that. Yep. 
But I, I think it is. I think it's a great challenge for us to to to, to live with as as individual Christians and as a church is that uh, you know we are we are image bearers <laughs> yes. of the Father, yes. Yes. and uh, you know it's it's a it's a humbling thought, yeah, but a wonderful thought, yeah, hundred percent, yeah. So is that a I want to just mention this comment. You might edit this out later, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was at a wedding a few years ago, and a Christian wedding, and the father of the groom got up to give a toast to his son. And at the end of his toast, he said, he said, this is my beloved son. Yeah. In whom I am well pleased. Mm. And there was a part of me that sort of s- sat up straight in my chair and said, you can't use those words. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. I had never heard them ever used other than to refer to Christ. Right. Mm. And here was a, a Christian dad looking at his Christian son getting married and use those words. Mm. It was, it was, yeah, it was very interesting. Um, it's quite a thing to say, but it mm. was it was a reflection, I guess, of that mm. relationship. Yeah, you know? exactly. Yeah, it's all about upreach, totally. Yeah. 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 So we start, uh, you know, a big core of getting to this point and developing ourselves as a reflection of Christ involves a lot of prayer. Involves good prayer habits. What we also do is worship. Mm. Worship is a really interesting concept, and uh, how we've developed this through church history. Um, I've, I'm always fascinated how we got to the point where music. Uh, is central uh, to our worship, and I think it's a beautiful thing. It's just really interesting if you think about of all the things in this world, music is the number one thing that churches across this province, across this country, across the world, is one of the ways that we do worship. Uh, it's incredible. When it comes to worship, um, I find that sometimes we can narrow our definition of worship a little bit because we're so accustomed to um, kind of this history of music which is, again, is very beautiful. I'm a worship leader. I love music, and it is a way that I worship very well. But I think there's a little more to that, and I know, I know you guys uh, know there's a little bit more to it as well. Um, so if someone was to come up to you and say, you know, what is worship? Loaded question. You would probably spend a lot of time on that, but if it was just a quick conversation. Um, I'll start with you, Jason. If somebody came up to you and said, what is worship, what would you say to them? Oh, what is worship? I mean, like I said, it can sound a little kind of pious, I guess, in ways to say it this way, but really it's a life spent honoring the Lord. Um, it's it's a lifestyle spent recognizing, you know, the, the lordship of Jesus and and it's it's ascribing all worth, you know, to God. But I think I think what we've I think some of the things we've been um, we've been led in as of late, and I'm sure Pastor Fred will get into this as he uh, as he references the sermon he preached a few weeks back in Romans 12, that that it's you know worship is not an event mm. that we attend or even mm. participate in, as, as much as it's 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 an absolute lifestyle. Mm. It's it's everything. It's you know mm. it's the air we breathe. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's. I think it's just a life spent honoring God. Yeah, I think that's that's spot on. You know, reflecting on that passage in Romans twelve, um, it begins by saying, "In view of God's mercy, mm-hmm. present yourselves as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship." I'm I'm caught by that first phrase in view of God's mercy. So worship is a response to what God has done in Christ mm. for us sinners, undeserving sinners. And and I think we, we must keep, you know, the cross, we must keep the gospel at the center of our thinking, our priorities, our attitude, whether it's in gathered worship or, you know, at school, at the workplace, at home. Everything really centers around how do I respond to the mercy of God? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Uh, and another phrase that's always kind of intrigued me in, in that Romans 12 passage, and I've often wondered, um, what do you think the term living sacrifice meant to a Jew to hear that? A living sacrifice. And, and what would the significance of that be mm. to a culture that was so entrenched for generations in a sacrificial system and to now hear that we offer ourselves to God a living sacrifice? It must, it must have been a shocking phrase. Mm. It's almost like Paul created this new concept <laughs> You know, because a sacrifice is something that that dies. Yeah, exactly. And it's done. And mm. it, it is an event. Mm. But if it's a living sacrifice, I guess it's ongoing. Mm. And it's not merely something you can describe as an event with a start and stop. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. So what does this look like in the 21st century mm. in terms of how we how we worship uh, as living sacrifices, especially in Western culture where things are pretty great. Where even in, amongst a pandemic, we have it pretty well. Um, how do we worship as living sacrifices? How do we do that practically? And what does that look like practically? Because uh, again, uh, you know, from my point of view, uh, we do get kind of caught in the music uh, a lot. Um, and that spans across generations. Um, Music has kind of been this central figure in our worship to the point where uh, everything is based off the sun, it's based off the tempo, it's based off, you know, how the tempo rises, how the tempo lowers, and that's kind of how we center our worship on, and that sparks the worship. Um, I look at that as a challenge in our worship, the fact that we need something to spark our worship when, again, we are the ones who are to sacrifice ourselves uh, in that moment, uh, regardless of how we're feeling, regardless of uh, what we're experiencing, or regardless of the, the method of worship that is being used. Um, we go beyond what is our preference, and we go beyond what is our um, our way of how we worship. Sometimes we, go, we really need to think about how do I worship in every single moment of my life. For example, uh, you know, I've, I, again, I'm a worship leader, and I've I've loved the music scene. Uh, I've worshipped, I, and I worship really well with music. But I had this really weird situation. This might sound a little bit philosophical, hippy-dippy a little bit, but I, I remember being in Small Point, Newfoundland, which is about an hour away from St. John's, is where my wife is from. And I remember uh, there was a meteor shower one night, and I never really stopped and looked at the, the sky before. And I remember, I remember looking back. I remember sitting down on this chair. I remember looking at the stars and, and all the, the brightness. And, and then I seen these meteors. We even seen one burned up in the sky. And in that moment, yes, there, I, obviously I was just looking at the stars and saying, ah, oh, this is really cool. This is fascinating to look at. But at the same time, I'm like, oh, my goodness. When you look at the stars, you realize how expansive this universe actually is, mm -hmm. how grand God is. Mm -hmm how amazing God is, how the fact that God, you know, meteors are burning up in the air, how is that happening? Mm. And I, I sat down in complete awe, mm. in complete worship, saying, God, you are, you're incredible. Mm. And th that was, that was an experience. So I was like, Hmm, this is not, there's no music playing right now. <laughs> and it, you, it almost throws you for a loop because we get so accustomed to this music centric worship mm. that we kind of lose a sense of what worship actually can be uh, on a greater scheme of life, and uh, that was a moment for me where I was like, okay, the, you know, worship uh, can can really take every aspect of my life, whether I'm in a grocery store and looking at what people can do. When I look at the skyline, I see what God can do with architecture through people and creations, art, painting. When I see these things, I can glorify God through that because God has created all of us to be able to do these things, and God created nature. And, and when I look at these things, I see such a grandness in who God is, and that puts me in a, in a place of worship where, where everything that I do is, is a living sacrifice for him. What do you think about Absolutely. that, Fred? Um, I was looking, I was just looking for the verse in the creation story where I think the stars, hmm. the stars get just a little comment. He also made the stars. Hmm. I think it's how it goes in the creation story. And I thought, it's almost like a throw-in, you know. No big deal. But it's but like you say, Greg, you know, the the, the universe is so massive. Yeah. And um, yeah, but I I was I wanted to kind of go back to the idea there of, you know, you're talking about music, and all. 
I wanted to talk a little bit in the context of upreach mm -hmm. and worship. <coughs> Excuse me. About the idea of, you know, gathered worship. Mm -hmm. So what is, uh, what what do we want to, to um, lead the people of God into in gathered worship? And I think uh, people want to come to a church that's alive, yeah. that there's a sense of God's presence, where God's speaking, where God's moving. Um, there's a there's a sense of of life mm -hmm. and uh, and and power, um, and I don't think we can create that. I think we can we can facilitate it yeah, in some ways. That's right. Um, and it also cannot be sort of consumer orientated. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And and there's there's a there's a fine line there I think between, you know, hmm, how do we how do we connect with people, speak their language, yeah. sing their music, to facilitate gathered worship, um, without without falling into the consumer trap. Yeah, mm. that's right. I'm, I, I'm I think there's a tension there. Yeah, mm. you know, because. You know, if if uh, if you're leading worship, Greg, and you're in the wrong key, yeah, right, right, it's going to be hard for me and Jason to yeah. sing. Yeah, it just is. Yeah. So that's that's a practical thing. On the other hand, if you're singing, you know, beautifully, and the music is just perfect, and you know, in timing, and the voices are just so in sync, it it almost draws us in, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm. Right. And God is no less deserving of my worship if you're off key. Right. Yeah. But the human reality is mm. if you're off key, it makes it difficult for us to yep. get into it. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> so that gathered worship, I find that, I find that, you know, dynamic in, th in terms of uh, every service is a little different. Yeah. But, but as a worshiper... I need to come to church and worship God. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I should not have my worship of God contingent upon, you know, whether you are singing a song I like yeah. or if you're on key or off key. That's right. The, the, but there is a tension there. There is a tension there, and I, yeah. you know, as a, I'm 26 years old. I grew up in a. In, in a traditional church, and there was always this tension of uh, of the music. Uh, absolutely, uh, in terms of you know, I grew up in a Hillsong generation where where Hillsong was a big thing, mm -hmm. and uh, you do get in a rut when you're younger of being consumed by Christian music and wanting your music played, mm -hmm. and that kind of goes both ways. You know, if you if you it has a lot to do with nostalgia uh, of listening to songs that were around when you came to Christ mm -hmm. and your experience through Christ and your beautiful moments in Christ. And so when somebody listens to Because He Lives, that's a beautiful song. If that reminds you of this beautiful moment where you came to God or you've seen others come to Christ, your family. Uh, and then there's songs that were written 10 years ago that I listened to that give me the same experience. So we have this huge spectrum of songs from, from different ages. Um, but we get caught up in, in our music because there's nostalgia attached to it. There's there's this sense of this is this is music that helped me get to where I am today, mm -hmm. um, but as worshipers, if if I'm coming to a service and there's no Hillsong or there's no you know Bethel whatever it may be, um, that's not what this is about. <laughs> you know, I I should come to a service and I should be able to worship regardless of whatever music it is. And listen, there's a lot of good music across the whole board. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not one good. You know, there's not one good definition of what good music is, whether it's a hymn, whether it's contemporary. We like to use that language. Uh, this is all music written for God, written to worship God. Some Greg, of it's great and some of it's, you know. Greg, I'll ask you and Jason this question. Like, do you think most people understand, now I'm talking about gathered worship, Sunday morning typically. Do you think most people would say that when the preacher is preaching, that is worship, that the people of God are to listen, to hear what God has to say, 
you know, to open their hearts to the word. Do you think most people understand that as worship? I, I wouldn't think that historically it, it's the way people would frame it. I mean, I grew up in a church where like, and I guess we all did really, um, certainly in our, in, you know, in our Pentecostal denomination where, you know, even the way the service was structured and talked about, it was there was the worship, there's the offering, yeah. there's the special singing, there's the preaching, there's the after service. And so worship, you know, and I, I don't say that as, an, as a discredit to people. It, it, it just tends to be kind of what grows on people. But no, I wouldn't think that, I would think that there's a tendency to kind of compartmentalize yeah. and, that, and that worship is, is largely looked at as when I'm singing yeah. or when we're singing. And, uh, but no, I think, I think, I think, uh, you know, going back to that sermon again in Romans 12, it's just such a great reminder to us that, you know, it's, it is that, but it's so much more than that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, that's been all the time we have for today. And we're going to get into a lot more conversation. And the good thing about Operation and Reach Outreach is that these are all going to connect. And that's the whole point. The whole point is that this is almost a triangle and you <laughs> You know, Pastor Fred has this triangle. It's it's something that we have in our offices, and it's a good way of showing how these three things are not separated from each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, we will continue these conversations uh, throughout. But that was an incredible conversation. Worship and prayer is extremely important to the Christian life. Uh, it makes us into the people that God wants us to be. Mm-hmm. And uh, again, if, to see God's kingdom come that we talked about earlier, yeah. and to be reflection. Uh, that starts uh, with God and talking to God, getting a relationship with God, getting to know the heart of God. And through that, uh, we'll become better people in God. So thank you for listening today. We appreciate you. And uh, again, we're going to try to do this every two weeks. Uh, if not, we'll have a podcast at, up at some point. Uh, but again, thank you so much for taking a portion of your day to listen to us. And again, we hope to see you soon. We love you. We appreciate you. We hope you have a great day.